Hello and welcome, Corinne Lacombe, CEO of We Thrive Global and Primate Connections founder, coming to you live from the jungles of Costa Rica. We're so glad that you've joined us today. The birds, I think they're glad too. For today's presentation, it's going to empower you with all the marketing tips that you need to succeed. In today's world, being seen online can make or break an organization. And so I'm here to share with you all the tips and techniques that you need to be seen, be heard, Garner, garner support and leverage your greatest gifts to make the money that you need to keep your projects going. And so who am I? As I mentioned, I'm Corinne Lacombe, CEO of We Thrive Global and founder of Primate Connections, but I'm also a conservationist trained in anthropology and primate conservation biology from Oxford Brookes University. And in all my time traveling the world doing conservation work, there was one thing that I noticed, and that is that the only time organizations stop doing the good work in the world that they're meant to do is when they run out of money. It's never due to a lack of determination, passion, commitment, or desire. And realizing this, I wanted to find what I could do to help alleviate this, to help it continue to empower all these organizations to stay on the ground, stay staying in the fight, doing the good work that they're doing out in the world. And that's why I've prepared this presentation for you, and that's why we do a lot of the things that we do with Primate Connections, which you'll learn about more on the video. So stick with us as we dive in and learn how to empower ourselves with marketing for the planet. The title of today's presentation is The Business of Conservation, Marketing for the Planet 101, Generating Valuable Momentum for the Conservation Community. What you can expect on this presentation are as follows. First, we're going to look at marketing and we're going to ask ourselves, can marketing help us achieve our conservation goals faster? We're also going to look at effective marketing and conservation psychology strategies that we can utilize to maximize our impact and get our projects and programs funded. We're also going to spend just a little bit of time looking and investigating the trouble with grants and the granting community structure. We'll also look at the power of, a, of an affiliate program. And if you don't know what an affiliate program is yet, that's fine. We'll cover all the details. And to end the presentation, we're going to look and we're going to explore the first important steps to generating more money for your cause now. As I mentioned in the intro, getting the funds that we need to support our programs and projects is essential for long-term sustainable conservation. And we're going to show in this presentation how we can do that. What we're going to do is look directly at marketing. And what I want us to do first is ask ourselves, what is our relationship to it? What is our relationship to marketing? How do we feel about it? What do we think about it? When you hear the word marketing, what kind of words and phrases come into your head? For some of us, it might be, oh, marketing bombards us, or marketing is evil, or marketing is, is sneaky and conniving. Maybe your relationship's somewhat positive. Marketing helps perpetuate things. Marketing is um, something advertisers utilize. Whatever it is, I just want you to get really, really present to your current relationship. Now that we've taken a moment to do that, I want us to just take that relationship and just set it aside for a second. Everything we think we know about marketing, everything we feel about marketing is all fair and well and good and I appreciate everybody's opinions and I've got my set too. But what I wanted to do right now and what I invited to do is just take that understanding and that relationship and just set it aside. We can pick it back up later. But for the purposes of this presentation, I just kind of want us to have a clean slate and to just come into the world of marketing this word marketing, neutral, calm, and unknown already, like have no knowingness of it uh, previously, so that we can just um, discover and delve into this topic from a neutral space and not let all of our preconceived notions um, guide us in any particular directions. So just understand what your relationship is, let's set it aside, and we can pick it back up later if we need to, or perhaps we'll develop some sort of a new relationship with marketing as we go through this program. And second, um, I want us to ask ourselves, can marketing help us achieve our goals faster? In order to answer this particular question, we have to first look at what are our conservation goals. And while I know there's a million goals out there, one that I came up with for purposes of this presentation is as follows. Our conservation goals, our goal is to sustainably protect and preserve wildlife, ecosystems, and biospheres through 
research, education, awareness, and action. But in today's world, because of the dynamics that the conservation discipline is inside of, and because the way of the world as it is right now, I think our conservation goals and the mechanisms through which we achieve our conservation goals have actually expanded beyond research, education, awareness, and action. I think now, in order to achieve our goals and to protect and preserve wildlife, ecosystems, and biospheres, we must also work through legislation, regulation of global supply chains, shifting of consumption patterns of the whole entire planet, um, and also increase environmental responsibility of corporations. All of these things need to be incorporated, and all of these things need to be tackled in order for us to achieve this goal of sustainably protecting and preserving our wildlife and our biospheres. So at first glance, this list looks very, very daunting, that we need to accumulate all of this and regulate all of that and take note of all of these things. It just seems a little bit daunting. But there is one Achilles heel, or there is one common denominator that can actually make this seem more doable and not as, as scary and overwhelming. And that is people. People are at the heart of everything we just mentioned. They're at the heart of our education programs. They're at the heart of changing legislation. People are the, the supply chain demanders and the supply chain providers. People really run the show every way you look at this scenario. They are the heart and soul of our conservation goals. And we need people to achieve our conservation missions and to make our projects and programs successful. And so because people are the common denominator, what we really need is people's attention, we need their buy-in, we need their trust, and ultimately we need their participation. If we get all of these things from people at large or locally, we are that much closer to achieving our conservation goals. So now I want us to look back at marketing. Marketing from some of the biggest marketing geniuses in the world can look and be described as something like this. Seth Godin says, marketing is a contest for people's attention. Interesting. Sue Nagel says, marketing is designed to bring people into something. That sounds a lot to me like buy-in. Peter Drucker says, the aim of marketing is to know and understand the customer so well the product or service fits him and sells itself. To me, that sounds a lot like trust, where there's a trusting relationship between the marketing company and the people to where you're making something and serving it up to the people so flawlessly that it fits them perfectly and they just go and, and buy or participate in whatever the product or service is that you're selling or marketing. And lastly, Jennifer Nelson says, the heart of marketing is behavioral modification and this will remain our focus. So as she says behavior modification, I'm reading participation. So from some of the greatest marketers in history, they're actually saying that marketing is going to achieve all the goals that we were just talking about. Grabbing people's attention, garnering buy-in, gaining trust, and then having some participation or some behavior modification. The only thing that's problematic here is um, who these people are that are saying all these things and utilizing marketing in these ways. So Seth Golden, Godin, he's, um, he's pretty decent. He's a best-selling author and entrepreneur and marketer and public speaker. Um, there's, there's nothing really, you know, in or out or right or wrong with, with, with Seth. He, he's he's um, a decent guy. Um, Sue Nagel is the president of HBO, so when she's saying she wants to bring people into something, she wants to be bringing people into HBO, TV, different things like this, modern media. Um, Peter Drucker is a management consultant, educator, and author whose writing has contributed to the philosophical and practical foundations of modern business corporations. So this guy is the first guy that I'm starting to wonder, hmm, are we really stoked that he's using marketing and all the power that it is to perpetuate corporations? I'm not sure if that's, you know, the best use of this tool, that seeing as how all the corporations are behaving these days. Um, and the last one comes from Jennifer Nelson, and she is the global director of strategy and insights for Johnson & Johnson. And so when we hear that the heart of marketing is behavior modification and that that will remain the focus for, for Johnson & Johnson, all of this makes my skin cr crawl just a little bit. You know, here we have marketing for TV, business corporations, Johnson & Johnson, and notably all the rest of the big corporations that go along with it. 
So here, all these corporations are using this magical tool that does garner attention, buy-in, trust, and participation, and they're using it for things like we just mentioned. So what my point is, is that we have to take the power back. We have to recognize what a powerful tool marketing is and bring it back to the side of good and to perpetuating action that actually heals and saves our planet rather than destroys and um, destroys and poisons it, basically. So we have to take the power back. This is what they're marketing for, and this is what we're marketing for. So marketing for the planet. One of the most important things to do in marketing is to first get noticed. Then you want to maximize engagement, cultivate action, and support and facilitate your customers, fans, friends, and followers. So how can we do this? Well, in the conservation world, we're quite lucky because getting noticed is usually pretty easy. One of the best ways to get noticed is to use beautiful, engaging pictures. And like I said, we've got this pretty much nailed in the conservation community. We have pictures that are adorable and intriguing and somewhat hard to distinguish, or you might have to take a, a second glance, like what's going on here? They can also be stunning and provocative. Also very captionable, animals just have a knack of doing things that, that we could make note of or make little jokes off of. For instance, hey, uh, you find anything in there? <laughs> uh, we can also post very easily things that are interesting or unusual that might take a little while for us to figure out what's going on there. Here we have the hands of a colobus monkey from Diane Beach in Kenya. Also, animals are delightful because they can often, often leave us photographs that are quite humorous and really make people smile or chuckle just a little bit. So we usually are very good at getting noticed. The second thing that we can do to maximize our marketing impact is to maximize engagement. Now, there's so many tricks of the trade now that the marketing companies use that I want to share with you so that, again, we can use all of the tools and techniques in this industry for good. Maximizing engagement. One of the first tips I have for you is to make spe specific requests to like or share something. Um, Buddy Media found that action words like post, comment, take, submit, like, or tell us are most effective. Posts that engage fans by asking specific questions and making specific re requests often result in 100% increase in engagement. If you give your fans a voice, by sharing content they want to engage with, you'll maximize their engagement. So always go ahead and encourage people to create a caption, write a question, take an, an opinion toll. Opinion tolls are also very, very, very powerful because not only do you get maximum engagement because people always want to tell you what you think, but as you learn what your customers and clients and fans and followers think, you can tailor your information streams, your pictures, whatever it is you're delivering to them to their liking. Going back just one moment to writing a question, I want to tell you that where, when, and should drive the highest engagement rates with would generating the most likes. Um, the industry's greatest suggests that we avoid asking why questions, which usually have the lowest like and comment rates. Other things that you can do to maximize engagement is to attach into current events and holidays. If there's something going on in the media at large and you tap into that, you can literally jump on the train of energy that is that holiday or that, that event and loop right in there and have your postings and your blogs skyrocket because that's just what everybody's talking about at the moment. The other thing is to take people with you on events and holidays. Now, this is something that I just learned about recently, but the experts say that if you tell your fans, hey, I'm going to be going to this event later in the week, and you post that and people see that, and then later take them with you to the event and start showing pictures of yourself at the conference, at the holiday parade, whatever it might be, that they get super engaged and feel like they're actually coming on vacation or on this event with you, and they'll often follow you all the way through the event that you're that you're attending it's a really really cool way to, to hook them in for a long extended period of time and have them really engaged in what it is that you're doing the other thing is to participate in online trends throwback thursday giving day cyber monday all of these things again are super trendy online and if you can loop your messages and your posts into them you'll find your things soaring as well 
The other thing is to remember school schedules. If you have a target audience of high school students or um, younger kids, or if you're dealing with parents who have kids in school, it's often awesome to really s celebrate with them. Tell them, oh, congratulations, it's spring break, I'm so happy, I hope you do something environmentally friendly this week. Or if you say, hey, summer break, you know, get into as much green action as you can. People really feel loved and remembered, and like you're really engaging and gaining rapport with them because you know and remember what it is that they're up to. Another thing is to write back. Writing back is a great way to gain that trust that we talked about earlier. So always take a moment to engage with your fans if they're taking the time to engage with you. Once you do this a few times, you'll see the development of the rapport and you'll find how uh, eager your fans are to continue to engage with you. Just a few more tips and, and techniques and some percentages that our experts have found. Um, research has found that 35% of Facebook fans like a page for the opportunity to participate in a contest. Other research has found that fill-in-the-blank statuses receive nine times more responses than average. If you want even more engagement, like we said earlier, be sure to ask questions. Here's one great example of a caption competition by the Barberry Macaque Awareness and Conservation Organization. They're taking a photo of this big male and asking fans if they can say, what is this guy thinking? This post ended up receiving a lot of attention online and just a great example that you can follow. The next most important thing to do to maximize your marketing strategy is to cultivate action from your listeners. So because we're in the conservation community, we're going to cultivate action in a particular way. Um, one of the best ways to do this is to share a solution. We're very far past the days where we just tell uh, our fans and friends things that are negative that are happening in the world without also offering a solution. Sharing a solution offers hope and it also increases engagement. The other thing to do is to articulate an action step. Now, I put this separate from just sharing a solution because what I mean by articulate an action step is I mean to articulate it step by step. And so oftentimes we might say something like, oh, recycle your cell phone and just kind of leave it at that. Well, though we've offered a solution, we haven't really articulated the action steps. Where, how, when can I um, recycle my cell phone? Is there any ways that I can do it the best way or the most um, serving way to you, the organization who suggested it? Can I like recycle it and have the contents or the proceeds go back to you? Really take the time to tell them step by step what to do and how to do it. Also encourage petition signing. Petition signing has become something that's extra, extra powerful these days. We're seeing corporations bend at the will of petitions. We're seeing things stop because the petitions are so strong. So it's really a force to be reckoned with and people really love it. And the more that you bring um, effective and prominent petitions to your guests and to your clients and to your fans, the more they'll start to see you as an organization that guides them. You're the leader. You're really letting them know which petitions matter and which ones don't. And again, as they can see the power of the petitions on the back end, they're going to be so thankful that you brought this to their attention and help them get involved in something that really matters. The other thing to do is request a pledge of commitment. Now, this is from the marketing community as well as the conservation community. We found in the conservation community that having people make a pledge, committing to recycling, committing to Meatless Mondays, committing to um, bring their reusable shopping bag actually has behavioral um, ramifications. They do engage in the behavior more often if they've taken a pledge versus not. And so this is a great way to maximize behavioral change and to again cultivate action and increase your engagement also one of the best things and this is just kind of a tried and true rule is that we can always lead by example as we lead by example we cultivate action people see us as leaders in this industry they want to know what we're doing and they want to emulate that so here at we thrive global we've actually just started a new campaign hashtag I lead by example and you'll be seeing more and more photos from us where I'll be up to conservation related activities like recycling or cleaning up trash or rinsing out my plastic bags so I can use them again, whatever it might be. These things are really, really powerful. And again, allow our customers to trust us and see us as guides.
The last thing is to cultivate collaboration. You know, as we're fighting this fight to save the planet, uh, the more collaborative we can be, the better off we all are. So if you can get a church group involved in your um, posts and in your promotions and in your programs, school groups, you know, boys and girls clubs, whatever it might be, the more people that you can cultivate um, to collaborate with you, the better off that you are and the bigger your program's reach will be. So cultivate collaboration with your fans, your volunteers, your schools, your networks, your family members, whoever it is. And as people um, will soon realize, you know, we have those six degrees of separation. So before you know it, if you encourage collaboration and reposting of your posts by your volunteers and your friends and families, somebody will see that post coming up about your organization from another friend in another circle. And people soon see how small the world is and how connected we all are and how together, if we we move in a singular motion towards a particular goal, how much faster we can all actually get there. So cultivating collaboration is a huge, huge bonus um, when you're marketing or sending out your conservation messages. So the last thing I want to talk about in really having effective marketing is supporting and facilitating your customers, fans, clients, and, and viewers. So I'm just going to read you this real quick and then ask a question. Here's the post. I was thrill thrilled to receive a copy of Ian Redmond's new book, The Primate Family Tree. Ian, who founded and runs the Great Ape Survival Partnership, was Diane Fossey's favorite student. Diane wrote me in October 1978, quote, The boy, Ian Redmond, who took a spear in the wrist, is just fine and will be able to go through his life showing off his poacher spear scar to his great-grandchildren with gusto. I hope many of you will buy this book and please share this wide postly. Now, this is an absolutely powerful share, but it is missing something. Let's look at one more before we reveal what's missing. Here we go. I have a limited number of Primate Connections calendars still available. Great gifts for family, friends and family. Message us if interested. We can have them in the mail today. Just $20 for large and $10 for small. 100% of proceeds go to conservation education. This, again, is a beautifully articulated post, but I got to ask, what's missing? What's missing from both of these posts is links. Links and email addresses that make it easy for the participants and the readers to go and follow through on the action that you've asked them to participate in. So what's fascinating is that people are extremely... Oh, for lack of better words, they're extremely lazy. And the research in the marketing community indicates over and over again that people will not take any extra steps. You literally have to step by step, write it out for them, supply them with everything they need right there, right now. They're not going to click out. They're not going to search for. They're not going to go back. They're not going to do anything. If you don't have everything that they need exactly right there in that moment, in that post, you're going to lose them. You're going to lose their participation. You're going to lose their donation. You're going to lose their attention. So we must facilitate and support every action that we're asking our participants to take or engage in. You have to include links and specific calls to action. Now, calls to action, it's kind of an interesting term. That just means asking them to do something, click this, buy that, participate in this, sign that, whatever it might be. And so one of the things I strongly suggest is that after you put a post up, you want to look back and say, what is my call to action? Every post is an opportunity for a call to action. Make sure you put them in there. I'm guilty of this all the time. And my fiance, Noah um, Hammond Terrell, who is an online marketing expert and, and coach and, and marketer, he makes me look back over my posts and says, hey, what's your call to action? And I miss them time and time and time again. And it's actually really a miss um, because every opportunity that you have to cultivate some action is, is an opportunity we should take. So make sure you include the links and specific call to actions. Always put all the website information in there that's going to supply your reader with whatever it is they need. Always give them the access to details that they need. Make it easy for people. I mean, there's even a stat in the, the marketing literature that says if your page takes more than four seconds to load, you can lose up to 60% of your traffic. That's how impatient people are. So you have to load fast, have all the information at their fingertips to really garner the support that they actually do want to give you. Um, but, you know, in today's world where we're moving so fast, sometimes they don't take the time unless you provided everything that's necessary. 
A couple other uh, little tips here is ex to explore bit.ly.com and hootsuite.com. Um, bit.ly.com is awesome because if you have a very long URL, like let's say when they were trying to advertise that book for Ian Redman, um, that they did want to supply the, the viewer with a link. And so they went to Amazon and they found where the book was for sale, but the link was, you know, 80 characters long or something like that. So it said, you know, Ian Redman's book, primates in peril dot com slash amazon one two three four five right so it's really long it looks kind of messy in your facebook post you can actually take that long url from amazon slip it into bitly.com and it will automatically shorten it to for you down to six to eight characters that you can fit inside your posts very very nicely and keep it nice and clean this is a free service and if you go to bitly.com it's very clear on on how to go about um, doing this Hootsuite is another really um, beneficial site and it, what it does is it actually is a platform for you to upload and handle all of your social media all in one place from one platform. So when you open up Hootsuite, Hootsuite um, inside there you can have your Twitter accounts, your Facebook accounts, your Google Plus accounts, your LinkedIn accounts, whatever it might be and you can organize and manage where you want your posts, when you want your posts to be put out. You can double dip meaning you have a post for um, Twitter that you also want to put down on, onto Facebook. You can ask the software to do all of that for you. You can post date um, your post or schedule them for later. Whatever it is that you want to do, you can do this all from one place. Now, there is a free version of Hootsuite um, that's pretty simplistic in what it can do, uh, but then you can get packages with this company starting at $8.99 and moving up from there, depending on how intense your um, social media organization needs are. But those are really two helpful, helpful tips. So a few additional tips and techniques um, from the marketing community is um, use emoticons. Um, HubSpot reports that something as simple as a smiley face emoticon in your post can increase likes by 57% comments by 33% and shares by 33% over posts without them. Very simple to insert and you're talking about a 57% increase um, in overall and then 33 in shares and, and likes. So this is really, really valuable um, increase in the shareability and the likability of, of your posts. Um, another cool thing, now this is just trending now, this is brand new research that's just coming out of the marketing community, is to drive people to specific points um, in an article, to a specific point in an article. So um, sometimes we do put up longer blog posts that are, you know, 500 words, longer, longer posts. They might be in our blogs, on our websites, in different areas, not just on Facebook. One of the best ways that you can encourage people to dive in there is to do something like you see in this picture here. So the title of the blog post is 26 tips to enhance your social media profiles. And then at the post at the top, it says number 20 still amazes me. So if you're writing a longer blog and you really want people to get in there and read the whole thing, you can put the blog up and then in the posting area, write something like, Wow, in the third paragraph where they share how his eyes looked up at the blue sky for the first time when the chimpanzee was released from its experimental lab um, just you know, brought me to tears. You can say something like that and this will drastically increase the amount of people that jump in there and read those longer, longer posts. The other thing I wanna talk about is timing. Timing is absolutely everything and there's pretty good rhythm that you can take advantage of inside the social marketing, the social media marketing uh, space, as well as the blog posting space and, and everything else. And so time of the day is key, time of the week is important, and also duration of post life. So what the research has found is that posts that are, are submitted and put up early in the morning and after work actually receive more engagement. So from 8 to 9 a.m. in the morning to the 5, 6, 7, 8 at night is the time of the day where most people are going to be online and able to engage with whatever social media you're posting. Also time of the week. Interestingly, people spend more time on, on Facebook and in their social media profiles um, during the latter times of the week. So Thursday and Friday, things start, action starts to ramp up online. And by the time you get to the weekend, this is where you're seeing maximum engagement, maxim, maximum utilization, 
of our social media platforms. And so um, if you've got to choose when to post or when to spend your time on social media, um, choose the latter parts of the week because this is the time when your viewers are going to see what you post most. The last thing is duration of post life. Now, this is really interesting. I had never heard of this before, but the industry experts say that um, the average post online has a, a lifespan of three hours. So that means from the time that you post, your action, your, your post will be in action and quote unquote live for up to three hours. So this is the time when you're going to receive maximum engagement, the time where you're going to be highest in people's feeds and the time that you want to take the time to go and write back to all of your um, viewers and fans who have left you comments or shared your posts for you and things like that. A good thing to note is that because the three hour lifespan exists, you actually don't want to double post within three hours either. They say that it's a very delicate system and that if we post um, more than once every three hours or you know get two posts within a three hour window, that's when we're leaning towards the side of being annoying or that we're coming up into people's feeds too often and we really want to avoid that. So duration of post life is about three hours. Go ahead and engage with that post. During that time, don't double post and really, um, you know, take take note of this because, you know, after three hours, um, that post is probably quote unquote dead and you don't want to spend that much time investing in it, in it anymore or have expectations of high engagement um, after that three hour window. Now, I just want to take a moment to talk about conservation psychology because, you know, marketing has a lot of um, tips and tricks and techniques and things like that, but it doesn't have the heart and soul that, that, you know, conservation does or that we might be looking for. So when we sprinkle in conservation psychology into all of this marketing talk, um, that's where the soul comes back and that's where we can really um, rest assured that, you know, we know we're utilizing a, a tool um, for goodness and, and with goodness. And so conservation psychology, the definition of it is, um, of course, not the final and only definition. You know how we scientists are. There's several, several renditions of, of this, and, and some people think a little bit differently about it. But conservation um, psychology is basically the scientific study of the reciprocal relationships between humans and the rest of nature with a particular focus on how to encourage conservation of the natural world. So basically, conservation psychology, um, how I like to say it, conservation psychology studies how conservation messages land on our psyche, right? So everybody has a certain schema, everybody has a certain worldview, and from different cultures, worldviews might be different, different ages, different stages, different families, different social organizations, all of these things might impact how a conservation message lands on us. And conservation psychology is the science of um, deciphering what that looks like and, and really just how conservation messages move through people's understanding and how they impact their attitudes and actions. So having said that, um, coming from the space of conservation psychology, we can say that powerful conservation messages are inclusive. Now, this is sometimes counterintuitive because um, what I'm saying here is that they need to be inclusive like everybody's doing it. In the conservation world, we've had a history of asking for heroes, like be a leader and, you know, stand out above the rest or be the one guy at work that, you know, enters into the carpool program or, you know, you can lead the way and be environmentally responsibly or, or stand up and don't be like everybody else and you should start to do X, Y, Z. Guess what? As like um, fanciful as that sounds, it actually doesn't work and often has even the opposite effect that we're intending. Um, people like to do what's normal. They like to be um, in the crowd. It's called social norm effect. And it's like um, people want to do what everybody else is doing. And so what's interesting is that it's really important for us to craft our conservation messages this way. Now I have up here the hotel example and I'm gonna take a moment to share this with you to just drive this inclusivity point home. So some of you might have been to a hotel recently and you notice that there's little placards at the hotel that say something about water conservation. They'll say, you know, we're working to conserve water. A towel on the floor means wa wash it please. And a towel hung up means I'll use my towel again. 
I do believe most of us have seen this. Well, Wes Schultz, um, a conservation psychology professor from Cal State San Marcos, and his students did a study, and they looked at how many towels were, were being recycled or used two times over versus washed um, for, for a period of time. And then they made a little adjustment to the placard, and they said water conservation... 87% of people pulled at this hotel agree with our green practices, and they're interested in helping to conserve water. A towel on the floor means wash it. A towel hung up means I'll use it again. They actually found significant reduction of towels making it to laundry after adding this 86% of our guests agree clause to the placard. And yes, that 87% or, or whatever it was, I don't know exactly, was very true. They did do um, a survey with participant guests and, and they found this to be true. So what happened was, is that psychologically, people got the notion, oh my gosh, everybody else in this hotel is using their towels twice, like up to 87% of people. I don't want to be the one room or the one guy who requested their towels be washed every day. I'm not going to be that guy. So I'll go along with everybody else. And just with that clause there, they had significant reductions, which I think is just so powerful. So again, the way to phrase a lot of our conservation messages is to say, hey, Everybody's doing it. You're not using a reusable, you know, shopping bag yet. Get on the bandwagon. Come on. And this can really, really be enticing for folks to just jump in. The next thing is to, to leave your conservation messages and your marketing and your posts and things like that generally positive. Bewilderment just doesn't work. You know, we here in the conservation community, we're a little bit guilty of doing kind of the wow factor on the devastation side. You know, tigers are going to go extinct in 10 years. Orangutans will only last another five. We're down to the last 500 rhinos. They're going to be gone before we know it. All of this um, communication is so bewildering. It leaves people feeling hopeless. It leaves them feeling like there's nothing that can be done. It can leave them thinking that the downward slope is already so steep. There's no way to push that rock back uphill. And so we just want to make sure that we leave people with a feeling of hope, a feeling of positivity, a feeling of possibility. Now I say generally positive because there is also some science out there that says if you hit them with a negative thought at first and then end on a positive note that that can be very, very effective as well. So for example, um, we did an experiment with Cal State San Marcos students and individuals at the San Diego Zoo, Insti or at the San Diego Zoo Safari Park and um, we had a, a palm oil message that was just positive and one that was just negative, and then one that was a combination. And the combination one said that, you know, at the rate the palm oil expanding, expansion is occurring, we're going to, we lose this many acreages of uh, rainforest per day, orangutans and sun bears are dying, but the RSPO and this organization and a lot of people are fighting for palm oil certification and sustainability, and you can help by doing this and this and this. That post, um, actually, or that message actually got the most, um, the highest score in intended behavior and attitude, pro-conservation attitude, um, from all of the messages that we tested. So um, if you want to hit them with some kind of deep, dark fact at the start and leave them with something positive, that could potentially work very, very well as well. Um, the other thing to do is to remember to always be solution oriented never leave people feeling helpless. Um, this has just been, you know, said time and time and time again. We can't leave people feeling like there's nothing they can do because they'll just turn and walk away and stop engaging with us. Um, this one, too, is interesting. Skillfully articulated, avoid garner garnering the opposite. And what I mean by this is that there have been some cases where our conservation messages has gone into somebody's psyche and their psyche is translated in, into the exact opposite of what we're intending. And so the story here is with um, the petrified wood in the petrified forest in a part of Arizona. Um, the guides there noticed that people were actually taking a lot of the, the petrified um, for wood pieces out of the park and taking them home with them and they wanted to stop this immediately so they erected these signs that said please don't take any petrified wood if everybody take, keeps taking it um, it'll soon be gone and no one else will be able to enjoy it now they thought that this was a really powerful thing leaving the, the message off with no one else will be able to enjoy it please don't do it this and that and the other thing 
But psychologically, what people picked up from this is, oh my gosh, I better get mine before it's gone. And once they erected the signs, they actually saw a significant increase in the amount of petrified wood that was being taken. So just really um, take the time to, to think through all the possibilities of how somebody's mind could take the information that you're sharing and kind of construe it um, inside, uh, inside their heads and just make sure that you're on, um, you're on a trajectory to get the behavioral um, action that you're looking for. Um, and then lastly, proximate and personal. Um, people take action on things that they care about and that are within their sphere of influence and understood to be in their realm of responsibility. And so I know that this is actually really, really hard for a lot of us because we work abroad, we work on primates or endangered species or you know humanitarian issues in other parts of the world, and most of our fan base is in the UK or the United States, so it seems like it might be a little bit impossible. But what's true is that people really do this. They take action on things that are within their, their realm of influence, their realm of responsibility, and something that they care and know about personally. So any time that you can take your call to action and revert it back to the person personally, you want to go ahead and do that and take advantage of that. So if you're talking about saving the rainforest, you want to say, hey, let's save the rainforest because it can bring you more oxygen. Let's go ahead and save, you know, the, the tributaries of, of the Peruvian rivers because this water system helps make sure that filtered water gets all over the world. Whatever it might be, just really try to bring it back. Recycle your cell phones to protect gorillas because the forest where the gorillas live is one of the last remaining forest stands that gives us X amount of oxygen on the planet. Really just try to bring it back to people because um, this will motivate them more than if you, if you don't. So having said all this, it kind of seems like a, a lot of work. You know, I'm talking about learning marketing tips. I'm talking about incorporating conservation psychology. I'm talking about doing all these things in order to raise money um, for our causes and to get seen and, and to stand out uh, among the rest. And so some of us might be thinking, hey, you know, why not just rely on grants? Grants are like tried and true. We've been using them for a millennia. Um, we know them, and this and that, and they kind of help us get the job done. Well, I just want to propose that there's several problems with grants. You know, one thing is that there's extreme uncertainty. You never know if you're going to get the grant the next year. You never know if you're going to get the full amount or half the amount. You spend all your time in the office, you know, writing the grant while you could be out in the field potentially doing something or teaching or whatever it might be. And you submit that and then you wait and you actually don't know if the money's coming. This is just... Um, not a very sustainable way to, to, to garner um, like a feeling of safety and security among the people on your team. Um, you yourself, I'm certain I know what I feel like when I'm waiting for a grant to come in. Um, and it's just uh, slightly problematic because there's just no knowingness and nobody can really settle um, when we're going the, the grant route. Um, also, you know, grants really restrict adaptability of projects. And this is really, really important because of um, not only the uncertainty with whether you're going to get the grant or not, but the uncertainty of the location that you're in, the species that you're dealing with, the governments that are that are um, in position in those areas, you know, the people, the climate, all of these things add so much uncertainty to the physical part of the project and that we just need massive adaptability and we need to be able to shift um, our management strategies. We need to be able to shift our, our programs, our outcomes, our intentions, um, our strategies, you know, on the fly when we're in the middle of um, the field and in the middle of our projects. And a lot of times grants just don't allow for that kind of flexibility. Um, it's interesting being in the entrepreneurial world now, we just talk about startups and um, you know, businesses that are just getting off the ground and how important it is to be able to flex and mold with what the people, the industry, you know, the land, the, the product, the supplies, the demands, what all those things need just right on the fly. And it's funny um, seeing it in the entrepreneurial world and watching how it allows startup businesses to become real businesses and really allows businesses to serve their clients in the ways that they actually need to. And how opposing, you know, that strategy is in the conservation world. And we need that. We need that flexibility so that we can think on our toes and, and turn corners and pivot as necessary. Um, so grants are also often political. I know we all know this. I don't need to belabor that point. Um, they often force us uh, to focus um, or take a particular angle on a project that might not actually be in perfect alignment with what the conservation needs are. I know this has happened to me a bunch of times. Um, 
problems with grants, they also um, allow for massive changes in management. We can cause a whole host of problems. I mean, some people were telling me about a project here in Costa Rica where um, the field team basically stayed the same, but the managers changed all the time because this university would get the grant one four-year chunk, and then the next university would get the grant the next four-year chunk. And, you know, the guys on the field and the community members were just um, totally conflicted by this. They, you know, took a couple years to get to know this managing, managing department and these managers and, you know, how things were being run. And then four years into it, right when they started getting comfy with everybody, the grant switched and a new manager management team came in and they had to relearn each other, relearn the mechanisms of the projects. Things got started and stopped and left hanging. And it just really causes um, a, a big mess. And, you know, the people that are involved in our conservation projects, most often they're there for life. And they're not, you know, up for, hey, let's try with this team for four years and then that team for the, I mean, this is their life. You know, having some stability and some trust and some knowingness is really, really valuable for, for people on, on the ground. And the other thing I've noticed that um, the grant community and, and a problem with grants is that it really entices competition among conservation groups. You know, when, when, when a lot of organizations are fighting for, for singular pools of money, it causes extreme um, resentment sometimes when that great ape organization got it instead of us or those guys got it and we, we should have gotten it. You know, I hate those guys or whatever it might be. And, you know, we need each other. We need to collaborate. And so... Um, if we're all fighting over these these singular pools of money, it doesn't really, you know, entice collaborative relationships. And so while I appreciate grants and I am so thankful for all the, the, the money and all the possibility they've brought into my life and my conservation objectives, and I know yours, I just want to say that there's some inherent flaws and that it's not necessarily a sustainable system. Even when you think back to 2008, when we had market crashes in the United States, a lot of grants just became unavailable. There was no way to even apply for the grant. And, you know, the work that we're doing is so massively important that we can't solely rely on something that is that fleeting and, and that uncertain. And so, um, yes, let's continue to do grants and, and do these things, but let's also really continue to think outside of the box. You know, what can we do to generate sustainable income sources that are in our own hands, powered by our own programs, and that allow us to have the integrity, the longevity, and the simplicity of of getting, you know, systems out and getting, you know, paves path with our programs and our thoughts and our missions, you know, out there in the world so that we can continue in our places and in our projects, you know, with some momentum and some, some success building. So, you know, some of the ways that we can think out of the box is with conservation commerce, you know, buying and selling goods that local people in our communities um, make and selling them on our um, platforms and our websites, all the handicrafts and all of the beautiful artwork that comes from different regions of the world. Um, ecotourism, bringing more people to our sites and into our projects. Paid volunteers, I know a lot of people are utilizing this right now, bringing volunteers to their sites that um, pay big bucks to come and play with us. Um, product creation. This is becoming more popular, but always something people can think about. Making water bottles or reusable bags with your organization's logo or, um, you know, project promotions on them that not only encourage behavioral changes, um, like using reusable water bottles and bags, but also promote your logo and your organization. And then online marketing and um, affiliate sales, like we've just outlined, you know, there's so many people looking at the interwebs every day. Billions and billions of eyeballs look here. And, you know, if we're doing really good in our marketing and more eyeballs see us um, and we've got a good cause behind us, that's the more donations that we can get. That's the more fans that we can get to like our pages. And that's the more people that we have um, assisting us in fighting the, the fight that we're fighting. And so I want to take just a moment to talk about online marketing and affiliate sales. You know, uh, affiliate sales are really a gem that not very many people um, know about. So what is an affiliate program? Well, an affiliate program is a system whereby a business or organization rewards one or more affiliates for each visitor or customer brought in by the affiliate's own marketing efforts. So basically, this means that a business has a product or service, they created it, they put all of the, the work into getting the product and service up and running and available for sale, 
And then all you do as the affiliate is promote that product and say, hey, anybody want to buy this product or utilize this service? And every customer that you bring into that business or who buys that service, um, you get a commission for, you get a cut, you get a reward. And what's amazing is that you can run affiliates with your own products or service, an affiliate program, with a product or service of someone else, or through Amazon and or others. You know, if you do have your own water bottles or bags, you can tell set up an affiliate program and ask your volunteers to put it on their Facebook pages. Hey, you know, buy this bag from from the Grace program and 50% of proceeds will go back to Grace. Well, you know, if you have 50 volunteers or 30 volunteers putting it on their Facebook pages, that's massive reach and you can get a lot of sales and even if you're giving that affiliate that volunteer, a portion of the proceeds, maybe 20%, maybe 50%, maybe 10%, whatever it is, um, you're still by and large going to sell more product because you have that many sellers out there working for you than you ever would um, alone. And so they're they're really, really a mechanism by which you can maximize your reach and and increase sales. Um, The other thing is this through Amazon. What's amazing is that let's say you're a lemur organization and you know that there's several books on Amazon that talk about lemurs. Well, you can sign up to be an affiliate at Amazon.com and say that you want to sell, you know, let's say, for example, Ian Redmond's book, right? What you can do is sign up as an affiliate on Amazon, go ahead and try to sell Ian Redmond's book, write that beautiful post like we saw earlier, put in the Amazon link, that's your special affiliate link for the Amazon book. And if anybody visits your website or your Facebook post and clicks on it and they go through and commit to buying the book, you'll actually get a portion of the proceeds. And this is live and available for anybody at any time right now. And so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go through um, our affiliate program here at Primate Connections and really show you um, how it works. But before we dive into that, I just want to say quickly the overall benefits of an affiliate program. An affiliate program is designed to help you make money easily with no overhead and little to no prep time. It's automated, transparent, and updates in real time. Uh, Affiliate program also alleviates the need to set up your own online stores and shopping carts, which I know a lot of us appreciate because we're maybe tech limited and marketing or the affiliate program also allows you to easily implement all the marketing tips and techniques that we just learned. So you guys are already very well equipped to be masterful marketers um, in affiliate programs. So like I said, we're going to go through the affiliate program for Primate Connections so I can show you um, how it works from the sign up to getting the affiliate link to using the links and posts and promotions, generating sales, and the fun part, collecting commissions. And so the beginning of our affiliate program with the Primate Connections calendar um, starts right here at this website. So um, if I was to invite you to become an affiliate, I would say, hey, do you want to be an affiliate for Primate Connections? And you would say, yep. And I'd say, okay, great. Start the process by clicking on this link here. And so we're just going to actually go ahead and do that. So after clicking and going to primateconnections.com slash calendar slash affiliates, you'll be brought here. This is the area where you simply fill in the boxes with the information that you, that pertains to you. First name, last name, company, address, date of birth. Some of these things are optional. Some of them uh, with the asterisks are the only ones that are absolutely necessary. Um, You do put your email address in. This will be the email address that the affiliate program converses with you through. Um, And also a password. Now there is an interesting thing. You always want to remember the password that you put in here because you will need to use it later. And after you finish filling all the boxes, there's just a little agreement that needs to be signed. Um, In our case, ours says, Welcome to Primate Connections Partnership Program. Receive commissions for sharing the 2015 Primate Connections calendar on your social media, email newsletters, or simply by spending, sending your special link to a friend or colleague. By completing sign up, you will instantly receive your affiliate login information and special links so you can make sales and track your commissions. And it's as simple as that. Once you click continue, as you can see right here, a message will be sent to us at We Thrive Global or to whatever affiliate organization you're working with. And soon you'll be approved and they'll send you an email back. Here, if you get an email back from the Primate Connections Affiliate Program, you'll receive an email from We Thrive Global. 
and inside it will look something like this. Welcome to the We Thrive Global Partnership Program. Your application has been approved along with this login right here. So what you want to do is you want to click on this login and also remember to take note of your affiliate ID as it says right here. This affiliate ID is actually your user ID once you get into the affiliate program. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy this, control copy, and I'm going to follow the instructions and I'm going to click on here to finish my registration as an affiliate. So this brings you to this page, affiliate login. I'm going to control paste in my uh, user ID and then I'm going to put in the same password that I used on the previous page where I was initially signing up. Once you click in continue here you go inside the affiliate program and this is where you can see everything that's going on. You can see your total earnings, how much you've made, um, your earnings balance, the number of transactions, the conversion rate, um, items sold, clicks, all these things and your commissions. Here's some of the specifics about how much you get in our case for Primate Connections affiliate programs. All of our uh, participants receive either 50% commissions or 20% commissions depending on our relationship. So this reverts to nice numbers where on commission on a large calendar is $10 and commission on a small calendar is $6. And this can really, really add up. So where is your special link? Well, it's actually right here. This is the link that is now yours. It's your special link. This is the link that you put into your newsletters, into your media posts, into your emails. And this is the one that has a special tag at the end of it, here you can see mine has a special tag. I think it'll let me roll over there. Um, affiliate ID dash equals uh, 186932. This is tagged for me. So when I use this, all I'm going to do is control and copy it. And now I have it in my repertoire and I can put it anywhere. And anybody who clicks on that to go discover the Primate Connections calendar um, will do so and they'll land on our page with a special tag that's associated with you and you'll get the sale. So let's see what happens if I click the link, if I go here because I just saw it in a Facebook post or something like that. If I click here, it brings me directly to the Primate Connections calendar page. You can see that the affiliate ID information is still here at the top and like I said, uh, pro affiliate programs alleviate you from having to put your own shopping carts up online and doing your own online stores. So this is tagged with your special link. If I'm the customer, I go to add cart. And as I finish my transaction and buy the calendar, it'll actually be attributed to, in this case, me as the affiliate and the sale will be complete and Primate Connections will fulfill the order, do the shipping and pay for any of the postage. And you'll just receive the benefits um, in commissions that will be, in our case, sent back to our affiliates every 30 days. So you just get a check in the mail and there's no more work to it. And this is the beauty of affiliate programs. And so a lot of times people ask me again, why? Why do you do this? Why do you have an affiliate program? Why did you set all this up? Why do you even do the Primate Connections calendar? And it's because of all of you. You guys literally bring us so much joy and you do so much amazing work on the ground that, you know, our why is you and because of all the great work that you do. And we just want to help you out in as many ways as possible to make the money that you need to sustain your projects and help you keep going and moving forward and what you're up to in the world. Now, the last thing that I promised this, this presentation would give is the first steps into generating more income for your cause. And in order for us to take this first step, I want us to do a little exercise. And what we're going to do, and if you have the, the ability to right now, grab a pen and a, and a piece of paper and literally do this with me right here, right now. What we're going to do to step into our first step of generating more money for our causes is we're going to go through this exercise of writing down money is. What I want us to do is write money is on a piece of paper and then just brain dump anything and everything that comes to your mind. Money is, you know, good, bad, ugly, whatever it might be in your thoughts. Just, you know, use your conscious mind, your subconscious mind. You know, don't hesitate. Write down everything, free flowing, everything that comes to your mind and just watch um, how on the piece of paper your relationship to money gets written out. And, um... 
I'm going to give us 60 seconds to go ahead and do this. But before I do, I just want to show you, this is what mine looks like. <laughs> Money is, you know, and my things range from, from powerful to uh, security, to handsome, to artistic, to tired, to association, uh, and all often opposing things I have on here. Money is necessary and required. And then I have money is not necessary or not essential, right? So, so go ahead and, and do that for just a minute. Money is. As you write, you might find some interesting things coming out of your brain. Just write them. Now that we've written this, I'd like us to consider one possibility. I invite us to consider that our relationship to money matters and it is reciprocal. How we view, treat, honor, or dishonor money is, reflect, is reflected back to us and reflects back on us. What does this really mean? Well, we here, my, my fiance and I and at We Thrive Global, we have a program called the Money Block Breakthrough. And in this program, we really explore this, this understanding that our relationship to money is reciprocal and that how we view and treat money matters. And I know experientially from going through this program and also from the hundreds of testimonials that we've gotten from people that have got through this program, that if we reorient our relationship to money, and that if we rekindle that relationship, and if we um, are conscious of that, that relationship, that abundance actually flows in. It's happened time and time again. And, you know, for, for my personal transformation story, I, I'll just tell you, I originally said that money is the root of all evil. Money is greed. Money is what's causing the environmental destruction of our planet. And I think a lot of us conservationists, we really believe this. Money is what drives people to do ugly things. Money is, you know, what allows the, the rainforest to be more valuable, dead and, and degraded than alive and intact. You know, money is, is, is so horrible. And, and I would say this and I believe this and I'd feel this and I have this relationship to money. And then I'd be like, man, I wish I could get some money, you know, to do my programs and my projects and things like this. And it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work to, to, to hate something and despise something and think it's bad in one breath. And then in the second breath, wish for it, hope for it, work for it. It's just not in alignment and it's just not... Um, really the best setup to get the funds that, that we need. And so by going through that money block breakthrough system that I was just sharing with you and, and some of the teachings that, that my fiance Noah brings to us, I literally transformed my relationship from one of hate and disgust into a relationship of love. And I tell you what, if you would have asked me 10 years ago, if I would have ever, ever, ever said that I love money, I would have cursed you and said it's not possible. And yet today I'm standing here in front of my conservation audience and I'm encouraging us all to love it. Now I know it's kind of a, a, a lot to, to probably, probably take on, but what I really learned um, through this Money Block break Breakthrough program and through really looking at my relationship to money, um, something was revealed to me, a, a truth. A truth was revealed to me and that truth is that money is actually innocent, neutral and unbiased. Money in and of itself has no agenda. Money in and of itself isn't doing anything. People are doing something with that money. People are choosing how to spend it. It's not actually the money's fault. And the truth is, is that money is powerful. Money is something that actually moves and shakes things on this planet like anything, like nothing else. And I'm not going to make a judgment call on whether that's good or bad. I mean, personally, I kind of like the barter system, right? It keeps things more real and more tangible, and you're, you're aware of what resources you have, and it have, doesn't have the ability to be inflated or, or deflated, right? But the way the system is right now, money is extremely powerful. And you know who has all the money? The people who have all the money are the people that are destroying the planet. And they're using that money to buy things and mine things and destroy things and to consume things, Right? If we can acknowledge and love money for what it is, this unbiased, neutral, and innocent powerhouse, and accept it and embrace it and request that it comes into our sphere of influence and request that it comes to us so that we can utilize it for good, we can literally transform the power paradigm of the planet. 
I want every dollar on this planet to go into the hands of people like you. I want all the money to come into all of our organizations. If all the money that the oil companies had was in our hands, in our projects, in our programs, think of how plentiful the forests would be and how far they would expand and how many children would be fed and how many good, amazing things would be happening on this planet. We conservationists have to stop being the martyrs, have to stop being the victims, have to stop being the people that hate money. It's a powerful force right now, and if we embrace it and we bring it into our sphere of influence, we can utilize it for all of the beautiful programs and projects that we hold in our hearts. And so with that, I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for the fight that you contribute to every day with all of your hard work. And I want to encourage us to go big, be bold, think outside of the box, and let's all stick together, because together we can. So with all the love in my heart, I hope you've enjoyed today's presentation, and I look, serving, I look forward to serving you more in the future. And to find out more about anything I've shared with you today, you can visit any of the following sites or email me directly at corinne at wethriveglobal.com. All my love to you. Thanks again. And remember, together we can. <laughs>